Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry says more than 4,000 Palestinians have been killed and 13,000 wounded in Israeli strikes. Israel has continued its shelling of the territory, including the south, where it had previously told Gazans to go for their own safety. Hamas has also fired rockets into Israel as Palestinians wade for that humanitarian aid to cross the border from Egypt. They are ready and waiting. A percentage of these aid trucks is supposed to be allowed through the Rafah crossing, the only crossing into Gaza not controlled by Israel. 20 in all aid trucks for Gaza. It's two and a half million people that need assistance. 20 trucks is a drop in the ocean of need right now in Gaza. <laughs> On the other side of the Rafah crossing, there is mayhem and despair. Even if southern Gaza is where Israel told northern Gazans to go for safety's sake. Heavy airstrikes in Khan Yunus in the south meant the overflowing Nasser Hospital took in even more wounded for critical care. There's no safety. There's nowhere safe in Gaza. You have to be ready to die and to just stay in your house. When there is a threat originating or uh, being conducted against Israel, from the south, and we will strike, absolutely. Israel's army will soon move into the Gaza Strip, Israel's defense minister told the troops massing on its border. I promise you that whoever sees Gaza now from afar will see it from the inside. Good luck. An Israeli ground operation will likely focus at first on the north, with Hamas expected to put up fierce resistance. All of that pushing even more Gazans southward, in need of food, water, medical supplies. And back on the other side of the Rafah crossing, aid supplies stream into a nearby airport, destined to join the backup, waiting to get into southern Gaza. For more, we can now speak to Frank Ledwich. He's a senior lecturer in strategic studies at Portsmouth University and a former UK military intelligence officer. He joins us from Oxford tonight. Frank, good to see you again. Now, since October 7th, the Israeli army has killed several members of Hamas top commanding brass. How much of a blow is that for the terror group? Yes, Nicole, good evening. They killed about six or seven major leaders and Operationally, I suspect it won't have decisive effect because leaders are always replaceable. And we found that ourselves while dealing with the Taliban and indeed the Islamic State. No, no one's irre irreplaceable. However, I think down at the tactical level, the combat level, what will be happening is people will be asking, who can I trust? The Israelis seem to be getting some pretty senior people. How are they finding them? Is it through traitors? Is it through tech? Is it through intercepts? So to that extent, it'd be sowing discord and uh, and cutting away at morale, I think. But Hamas has been quite open about their commanders getting killed. Why is that? Because, as you said, they presumably risk looking weak. It's part of combat. They will announce their losses uh, with some pride, I suspect. These become martyrs and heroes to their cause. I don't think that's, I think that's fairly normal in these circumstances. Uh, they'll, they'll announce them with pride. Hamas has released two hostages today, reportedly on humanitarian grounds after Qatari mediation. Do you think this is a one-off or could we be seeing a major breakthrough here? I don't think it's a one-off. This would be a strategic negotiating tactic on the one hand and a propaganda, uh, a propaganda effort on the other. Uh, it's worth mentioning, by the way, that... Uh, under Islamic law, it's fairly settled that women and children should never be harmed and preferably should not be held as hostages. Uh, so this release can be used, I suppose, to establish some kind of legitimacy. But, but of course, that's, that's just propaganda. What's happening here is a negotiating tactic. And we'll see, I think, several more of these releases to remind the world of who they have and what can happen if, uh, if their, if their uh, demands aren't met. Yeah. A negotiating tactic to what end? Because the timing here is interesting, isn't it? Could this be an attempt at staving off Israel's announced ground offensive? I don't think so. And if it is such an attempt, it, it's going to fail. The I, I, I never I don't think many of us expected the offensive to go off before before now. Of course, there are all the political visits and so forth. But in one sense, Israel has the upper hand. It's got the whip hand. The longer it 
holds off, the longer it has time to build up its uh, picture of the battlefield, to set up its intelligence framework and its targeting. And uh, I, there's nothing I think Hamas can do to, to delay that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the ground offensive that does seem imminent. Hamas is hiding in civilian infrastructure in a sophisticated tunnel system while holding all of these Israeli and international hostages, over 200 at this point. How does the IDF plan on going about this incursion? There's a huge amount of assistance they're getting. They, they, they have um, probably world-leading capabilities in hostage identification, location and rescue. The idea will be to get what what are called triggers on on and each each hostage will be certain groups. They will know where certain groups are. U.S. intelligence, a huge U.S. intelligence um, infrastructure is now directed towards this as well. And it's I think it's in the open. Well, certainly is in the open sources that U.S. special forces are on the spot too. So the first problem, of course, is to locate the hostages, and the second problem, uh, the more serious one, I think, or even more serious, is to get people in and get them out. And those efforts will start, if they haven't started already, uh, very soon. And we will see results. But sadly, it's, it's, I think, in fairness, uh, it, it's, a, it's a long stretch to hope that they will all get out. But all the efforts of Israeli, formidable uh, Israeli intelligence system, plus the US, and I suspect the UK, Germany, France, and others, are focused on this problem now. And that's a pretty formidable array. Yeah. Uh both Hamas and Israel have not been oblivious to what's been happening in Ukraine in the past year and a half. How could that influence the current conflict between them? Considerably. Both sides have been watching particularly the uh, developments, in, well, in, two, in two, two elements. First, in the air. The drone war will be very intense in, 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 in Gaza, I suspect. Uh, Israeli soldiers, as I said before, will have to look up. They'll be looking up and uh, uh, watching for strike drones, suicide drones, and, of course, for, for surveillance. And the Israelis will be using uh, drones and, and, indeed, AI and uh, AI-directed drones, uh, as you see or beginning to see, actually, in Ukraine as well. So there's that aspect, too. Uh, precision uh, artillery, very important. We haven't seen too much of that yet, but we will. So far, we've seen air, air, air take, the, uh, take the lead in precision strike, but artillery will be a major factor. But of course, there are elements in, in Gaza are totally different, not least the, uh, the nature of the battle. It's totally urban. And of course, the tunnel systems. And the fact that Hamas knows the ground so much better than the IDF, how big of a complicating factor could that be? Uh, Pretty, pretty considerable. The IDF, of course, has, has mapped every square centimetre of Gaza over the last 20 years and will, in, in theory, know it well. But you're quite right. That, uh, that intimate local knowledge is very important. Is it decisive? No. There is another aspect, I think, which, isn't, is, which is rather unpalatable, but it's nonetheless significant. Israel soldiers want to survive. Hamas uh, terrorists are, are not interested one way or the other. And therefore, there's that human element. Uh, which will undoubtedly work to the detriment of many people, will increase casualties. And finally, of course, Hamas have that weapon of, uh, of the many thousands of human shields that they are holding, not just the hostages, but their own people and the political effect uh, engendered by their, 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 uh, their killing. Yeah, I mean, the world has been watching uh, in, in horror, really, um, to the, the deteriorating situation of innocent civilians in Gaza, and that is even before this ground offensive has even started. Uh, how can Hamas, I guess, as well as the IDF, go about accomplishing their goals while respecting international humanitarian law, which both warring parties are obligated to abide by? Well, they may be ob obligated to abide by it, as indeed they are. Uh, only one side's making the slightest effort to do so. We have to draw that bright white line between deliberate killing and inadvertent, uh, inadvertent killing. Uh, the, uh, look, IDF commanders understand fully the effect of, of, of the destruction of human life in a situation like this. And when people do die, you can be sure that uh, whether there's compassion or not, uh, Israeli commanders are, are, are wishing it didn't because they understand the political effect more widely of this and the effect it might have on international, particularly locally. And when I say locally, I mean in the region. Uh, of course, from Hamas's side, 
the more of their own people are killed. From that perspective, the better. And in one sense, Israel's walking into a trap. It has no choice. There's no 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 alternative, I think, for Israel to do this. But uh, this this is this is the situation Hamas wanted, and it's a situation into which Israeli troops are going to have to to assault. That was Frank Letwich. Thank you so much. Always great speaking to you. Thank you, Nicole. Well, Julia Touma is Director of Communications at the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees. She joins us from the Jordanian capital, Amman. Welcome to DW. When do you expect the Rafah border crossing from Egypt to open? I don't know, actually. I really do not know. What we do know is that people are in dire need and uh, they need humanitarian assistance and uh, supplies needs to need to reach them as soon as possible and the siege on the gaza strip must be lifted UNRWA and other humanitarian agencies have not been able to deliver any humanitarian supplies to people in gaza in the past two weeks alone what do you what do you understand the hold up to be I, I really do not have those details. What I do know is that the situation on the ground for people in Gaza, including half a million who shelter in UNRWA schools and other facilities, is absolutely terrible. And this is largely due to the lack of supplies uh, that have been running out for the agency I work with, UNRWA. What can 20 lorry loads of aid achieve in a situation that used to require 100 a day? It's a drop in the ocean. This is exactly why the UN and UNRWA included are calling for sustainable humanitarian access and regular humanitarian access so that aid flows into the Gaza Strip for people in need, among them women, children, old people flows on a regular basis. The situation in Gaza was described as catastrophic even before this war broke out. Is there a difference in the aid that you need to get in now, now that there are bombs and missiles, to before, or is it just more of everything that is needed? Yeah, two million people who live in the Gaza Strip, that's... Uh, that's like the population similar to, to Brussels, as one example. Imagine if the whole of Brussels is in need of humanitarian assistance or have been impacted in one shape or another by a war. So we need a lot of supplies because people are in need of supplies and they're running out of water. That's the most critical part. This is why we're asking for fuel, because fuel is absolutely critical for the pumping station so that taps in people's homes can start running with clean water. So what's on those lorries waiting to get in besides uh, a fuel and uh, a food? What else uh, are you trying to get in there? Uh, water, food, supplies that are essential, like cleaning supplies. Um, yeah. The uh, Part of the, the deal that, that uh, appears to be being struck between uh, Egypt uh, and uh, Israel about this, this, Garda cro uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, crossing uh, into Gaza is that someone will have to guarantee that um, aid does not get to Hamas. It only gets to the Palestinian people. Will that, will that, that policing involve uh, people uh, from the UN, or will that be done uh, by the, uh, someone from uh, Israel or, or indeed Egypt? Andra has been on the ground in the Gaza Strip for seven decades now. We have been giving supplies and assistance, including development assistance like schooling. Uh, for people for many, many years now. We have very strict scrutiny systems in place. Our own staff, 13,000 of them, they get screened. So we know where the assistance goes, and it goes to people who need it most. Thank you for joining us, uh, Juliette uh, Touma, uh, Director of Communications at the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees. Thanks so much. Israel is planning to evacuate the city of Kiryat Shmona following days of clashes with Hezbollah fighters along the border with Lebanon. The city is home to 20,000 people and is just two kilometers from the border. Israeli authorities have been steadily evacuating communities along the northern frontier. Eyal and Ido Goldstein have driven up to Kiryat Shmona to pick up their father. 
They're taking him south and out of range of rockets fired across the border by Hezbollah. My father is living here in Kirat Shmona. We take him, take him, uh, take, take her to my home and uh, try to survive. And this is why they're leaving. Sirens wail as a barrage of rockets streaks towards Israel from Lebanon. Kiyat Shimona has already been hit by those munitions. The army says it's time to go. This kind of evacuation allows the IDF to expand its operational freedom to act against the Hezbollah terrorists. Many residents have in fact already left before the enforced evacuation. But they're confident they'll return. Actually, the situation in Israel right now it's very difficult, like my brother say, but you know what? We're going to win. No one is can beat us. That's it. No one is can beat us. This is what all over the world need to understand. We're going to fight and fight out. Residents fleeing the north are now joining tens of thousands of Israelis who have left their homes in the south near Gaza.